I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Andrew Falkowski, and I am not joined by Taylor Sparks. Instead, I am joined by Jared Duffy. Jared, how are you? Oh, you know, I'm good. Uh, Christmas is over now, so it's less fun. You know, I'm just kind of right back to work and back to the sludge of life. No holidays for a while. Yeah, I feel you. I, I started my PhD this semester, and I, I've reached a level of busy that I never thought was possible. But uh, that's how life goes. I am learning a lot, so it is fun in that respect. Oh, well, that's good, obviously. I mean, I like my job a lot. So there's benefits, but there's something about, you know, when you're busy five days a week and you just get this Tuesday off, you think, man, I miss Christmas break. Yeah, no, it's nice. Sometimes I think about the number of holidays that medieval peasants had, and um, I'm a little jealous. Oh, yeah, if only we could have that many, huh? Yeah, maybe one day. But um, we were talking uh, during Christmas break. You were doing a little bit of reading, and you had an interesting idea for an episode. Yeah, so the thing that really kicked this episode off for me was I received a book for Christmas called Skunk Works by Ben Rich. So for those who don't know, Skunk Works is the informal name given to Lockheed Martin's Advanced Development Program. Ben Rich was the second director of Skunk Works uh, from 1975 to 1991, and he was following up Kelly Johnson. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you people out there who listen to this who were really into aviation, you're going to know who Kelly Johnson is. Kelly Johnson is probably arguably like one of the most important uh, aviation engineers, aeronautical engineers of all time. Uh, I would say he's probably most known for designing the SR-71 Blackbird and kind of uh, overseeing that entire program, but he's made the P-38 Lightning, uh, U-2 spy plane. He was over a bunch of planes during his time at Lockheed. So how does Ben Rich follow up this impressive legacy? Well, he oversees the advent of stealth technology as we know it today. And it's a very interesting story, kind of talking about the different things that go into stealth. But of course, the thing that captured my interest also was the materials that go into it. And so I pitched uh, this to Andrew, and he was game to do it. And so we started researching. And I got to admit, we didn't know just how complicated this was going to get, but I think we sorted through it really well, and I think we have a great episode for you guys, and I'm really excited for you to hear it. Yeah, definitely. It was sort of one of these rabbit holes where the complexities of it just kind of continued to unravel as we learned more. And it it wasn't so much an episode where it was, okay, you know, where can we dive deeper? Where can we learn a little bit more and make this more interesting? It was, okay, where do we need to stop? Um, we've maybe gone a little bit too deep, and we're starting to lose our audience and our own sanity. And so... I think we did actually a good job of finding the right balance here. But when Jared was initially talking to me about this and telling me some of the stories and the anecdotes of what inspired, you know, the development of these stealth technologies and, you know, examples of how effective they were, it really brought back this story of um, when I was in Boy Scouts, we played this game called Army Tag. And the idea was that you had an attacking team and a defending team. And the defending team was defending something like a bench, for instance. Or maybe it was like the deck of like a... um, an Eddie Rondack or something. And the goal of the attacking team is to basically touch that or to get on the bench or something like that, right? And so what we do is we do this at night. So it was, you know, pitch dark. We'd be camping, right? So there's there's no light pollution. And the defenders would have flashlights and the attacker's goal was to, you know, they'd start on the opposite end of a field or some sort of forested area and they'd move through and try to get it. And I remember when I first started, I was, you know, I was pretty naive. I was like, okay, if I'm just the fast enough, if I just run right at it, um, you know, I'm going to be able to sneak around them. I'm going to be able to get to that. And I quickly realized that that's not the way to go because with those flashlights, they would always just see me coming from a while, you know, see me coming from a long way away. And then they'd be able to just, you know, be get ready you. for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it didn't matter how fast I was because they could prepare for me in advance. Of course. Yeah. And so as I got older, I started realizing, you know, you have to sneak. You want to get as close as you can without being detected because your chances go up of being successful. Mm-hmm. And I think... A lot of these examples you're telling me are a lot like that, and that's generally the strategy we go for. Yeah, I mean, a great example of what you're talking about, uh, it's mentioned about the raid on Saddam Hussein's nuclear research facility. So the first time they attempted this, they used conventional brute force methods. 72 aircraft in total went after it. 
14 of those were just fighter planes and all of the compliments you would need to give it the best chance of succeeding. And when it was over, they did not score one successful hit on the entire facility. So what they did was they took our stealth plane at the time, which was called the F-117 Nighthawk, and they sent eight of those in with two tankers just to refuel. And that was it. And using stealth planes, which like you said, you know, you get a lot closer to your target before you get seen maybe visually or in another way. They were actually able to destroy three of those four reactors, and the fourth one they damaged very heavily. They said that actually in the entire time that they flew these during Desert Storm, they flew 1,271 missions, which is less than about 1%, but that aircraft accounted for 40% of all damaged targets. In fact, the Secretary of Defense under President Clinton referred to them as the enablers because they could go in and take out these defenses, and then you'd send in the actual aircraft that maybe, you know, had a little more firepower but could be detected easily. Yeah, and it really is a number of key technological advancements that allowed this to happen, right? Like, it's both the shape, the really unique shape of these aircraft, but also the coatings, the materials of these aircraft as well. Um, But before we get into what those are and why they're so important, as well as the complexities of these materials, we should probably start at the beginning and look at how stealth has evolved over time. Yeah, so, I mean, like you said, you know, for you, you were worried about being spotted. And so the first thing that we had back in World War I when airplanes and other things started going for that more stealth look was visual inspection. And to this day, visual inspection is incredibly important, which is why we paint planes that are military-based, usually these dark grays and blacks, because that way, against a night sky or a darker sky, you won't see the aircraft. I think that was something that really helped the Nighthawk was that it was full black underneath, so you couldn't see anything. But this doesn't just apply to planes. So in World War I, they had taken boats and they had covered them in these zebra prints, basically going all around different directions and blocked out so it wasn't just one long zebra stripe. And the idea was is that now when you're looking at the boat, you can't tell entirely which direction it's going, which makes your cannon fire and your torpedo fire much more difficult because you don't have an exact heading. Right. This is before any sort of guidance. So you're basically trying to like compute maybe the trajectory and hope yeah. that it, it lines up. And th- that's sort of not necessarily like that's more or less disguising your movement, not necessarily disguising the thing itself. Yeah. Um, which, you know, at the time, if, if visual inspection is the method and with a, pl- uh, a, you know, a ship that's so large, you know, mm-hmm. that might be the, the method you have to use because you're not going to hide that. Yeah, I think, that, you know, they call it this dazzle camouflage. And I think it's probably because it really overloads your senses with so many things that you have to sort of discern what's happening. Yeah, I mean, the you should look it up, the dazzle camouflage. It looks like a herd of zebras. In fact, um, other words for groups of zebras are, are called dazzles or, um, or zeals, um, which is kind of interesting, maybe a little more poetic. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does look like that. It's a great example. Yeah, we'll definitely post a, f- a photo of this. But going back to aircraft and really the heart of stealth is the idea of being invisible. Now, how do you make an aircraft invisible? The Germans thought they had a way in World War I. And so they said, okay, here's our plane. And a plane back then, you know, it's got fabric, and the fabric goes over between these ribs. They said, what if we take out the fabric and we use cellulose acetate? It's somewhat similar to film. It kind of looks like saran wrap to me a little bit in some of the photos. But uh, basically, they stretch this over, and they get the aircraft in the air. And from a few hundred feet up where it sits, down below, you can barely see it. And they think they got a hit on their hands. They did not take two things into account. The first thing is that underneath, hard to see. From the top, when the sun's glinting down on it, it lights up like a Christmas tree. So if you're in a fighter, suddenly your target is very clear. And now, here you are in your German plane trying to dodge. So as your wings heat up, cellulose warps hard. And so suddenly now your plane's unstable. And, okay, you get hit, you're going down for a crash. What's the other thing about cellulose? Incredibly flammable. So the second your plane hits the ground, just a fireball. So they backed away from that idea. Yeah, and I think this highlights this interesting dynamic, um, especially with the materials for this application, is, you know, you could maybe find the best stealth material, the most transparent, invisible material, but you still have to work with the the rest of the aircraft. Like, you can't compromise those performance metrics either. Mm -hmm. And so there's a trade-off here. Yeah, all materials and things in life have a trade-off, and I think this is such a great example of one of them. And so you showed that, okay, for optical inspection, you know, that we can paint it colors, 
that's mm-hmm. kind of probably the best we can do. Um, and operating at night, you know, a black aircraft probably is hard to detect. But we came up with other ways of seeing things beyond our eyes. Yeah, so the next one we'll talk about is IR. And so IR is very effective on aircraft because especially in jet aircraft, they have exhaust plumes that are incredibly noticeable and really high temperature compared to the air. So how do you disguise exhaust plumes? There's three different ways you can go about it. The most interesting one to me is actually putting fuel additives. Uh, There's a very interesting one mentioned in the uh, book that I read, and it's referred to as panther piss. It's a bit of a crude term, but essentially what it would do is ionize the exhaust plume in a Blackbird aircraft, and it would cause the enemy infrared detector to sort of break up incoherently and not work. And this actually makes it really effective for keeping the aircraft stealthy. Another one which they use in the F-117 Nighthawk mentioned earlier was just picking a smaller engine because if your engines aren't supersonic, they don't give off as much heat usually because they can you can make a more efficient engine. And then finally, you put the engine on top of it so that you can't see it from underneath and you put some sort of plates to help dissipate the heat. Okay, so that's thermal detection. That makes a lot of sense. There seems to be some ways we can kind of disguise that. Mm -hmm. Probably an ongoing problem, but there's one we're missing, one of the big ones and the main topic of this episode, and that's radar. or using um, electromagnetic waves kind of in that microwave spectrum to send um, a signal and then have it bounce back and receive that. And that can tell you a lot of information. Um, And the origin story of it are, are quite interesting. It seems a bit confused, a little bit muddied. Yeah, so... Everyone agrees on where the initial idea came from. It came from Heinrich Hertz. You know, he's got a a whole unit named after him. So, you know, he did some important science. What he did was he basically sought out to prove something that James Maxwell had said, who was a Scottish physicist. He had said that both light and radio waves are waves that are governed by the same kinds of laws. And so that if light reflects, theoretically, radio waves should reflect. And they set out to do that, and he actually proved it. Turns out radio waves can be reflected from metallic objects, and this sort of creates the ground for radar, but its actual prominence, as we know, it doesn't come up till the 30s, and that is where it gets muddy. Essentially, every major player in World War II came up with radar independently of each other. There's some claims that Britain did provide some of its information to Uh, allied nations to help them build theirs but it kind of sounds like a lot of them sort of created their own which is why a lot of them actually operate at different frequency levels too but the british one which is probably the most well-known one because they had theirs done by 1938 and fully ready to go was created by robert watt who again he's got a whole unit named after him so you know he knows his stuff but the reason that they built theirs so quickly is they weren't really worried about how precise the technology was because they were so terrified of German air raids. They wanted something up immediately that could just do a crude job because some information was better than nothing. Radar, at its most basic form, is essentially sending out an electromagnetic wave. It travels until either it dissipates or it hits something. And if it hits something, it bounces back, and you get some information, which is essentially just what got bounced back in the time lapse. And so what got... Bounce back gives you a general idea of the size, which we're going to, from now on, refer to as the RCS, which means the radar cross-section. And you're thinking radar cross-section is going to be the size of the aircraft. It's not. RCS is kind of complicated, and it is not a perfect reflection of the size of an aircraft. So really the best way to understand it is it's just what the radar sees as the size of the aircraft. You know, something I, I noticed when I was doing reading for this is that the the band the range of what qualifies as a radar is uh, is quite large is there a difference between like maybe the like higher or lower frequency versions yeah so uh, radar goes basically from 50 megahertz all up to 12 gigahertz and essentially these lower ones are all about long range surveillance so over the horizon you're seeing what you can see but as you get more power you're actually getting closer and closer so essentially the highest ones are usually used for short-range tracking, like checking on missiles and stuff, because these these higher frequencies allow for a lot higher fidelity, and so it's better for close-range stuff and giving as much info as humanly possible. 
Yeah, I mean, also with these higher frequency electromagnetic waves, you'll actually get a lot more atmospheric scattering compared to the longer wavelength. Mm -hmm. I think that um, a lot of the highest ones are used for airborne intercept when it comes to knocking missiles out of the sky because you need such high fidelity for that stuff. Yeah, it's like a question of precision. Yeah. So radar gets a little better, obviously, as time goes on because we start moving away from having these mechanical dishes that move to a phased array, which is essentially multiple emitters, and they form like a searchlight that you can actually aim, and it leads to faster and more accurate stuff. And so radar becomes a huge concern for how do you avoid it. And there's a few different ways. The first way that we approached this was actually overloading the radar. Easiest way to do that is something called chaff. So what chaff does is it's basically dropping a bunch of aluminum strips. These aluminum strips are highly reflective, and they reflect radar waves back. And it covers the entire screen in little dots, and so you don't really know what the airplane is. As our radar has gotten better, it started using the Doppler effect, and you can tell essentially the speed and shift out lower speed items. And because of that, this chaff, which has which has a relatively light weight and kind of falls slowly, it, it doesn't move fast, and you can filter out your incredibly fast airplane from this slow falling item. But it still is used somewhat against m- like radar guided missiles and other things. And there's different techniques for trying to make it more effective. But essentially, it is losing its effectiveness. So the next idea was utilized by the U-2 spy plane. This is something that you really do not see a lot of because it is not incredibly useful for wartime. But the idea is fly over the radar. At the time, America had thought that Russian radar could only go so high because that was about how high ours could go. And they didn't think that Russia had dumped so much money into increasing this. And so they created the U-2. Now, the thing that made the U-2 special is that it had a service ceiling of 70,000 feet. Most aircraft could never touch that height. And so they built this aircraft, and they started overflying it in Russia. And they weren't shot down, but what they realized is that Russia knew what they were doing because Russia themselves had increased their radar range, but their surface-to-air missiles could not hit that high. So they started flying their fighters under it. They would try to block the camera on the surveillance plane from seeing anything on the ground. And what Kelly Johnson, who was the president of Skunk Works at the time, would actually call aluminum clouds. Huh, interesting. Yeah, it's a, I would love to see a picture of that. I'm sure there must be one somewhere. Yeah, there, there probably are. There's always those really fun kind of photos. I actually have a, a sort of fondness for wartime photos taken on film. Oh, yeah. There was a, I mean, there's an incredibly interesting thing about the type of camera they used because at 70,000 feet, getting a picture of that, accurate that you can actually like you know pick out planes and things on is really hard and so they i think worked with kodak to develop a special camera just for this plane that would have been a fun project to be on i'm sure it was very interesting especially the film types and everything they used so when you're going when it comes to a fighter jet or other planes you know you can't fly that high so what else do you use you use what's known as ew or electronic warfare now the main way we do this is basically you have a transmitter in your plane that transmits the same signal as the radar, and it kind of muddles the radar wave because it receives this large signal back much more powerful than a reflection. The issue with this can be, though, which did happen with uh, some of the U-2s that we gave to Taiwan, is that if you transmit the wrong signal back, it basically paints a huge target on you. And what happened was is three of the four U-2s in this flight were shot down, and the fourth guy came back and said, like, wow, I'm so lucky I didn't get shot down because I forgot to turn on my radar jammer. And at that moment, Kelly Johnson realized, oh, the radar jammer's the problem. It turns out the radar frequency was changed, and they didn't know it. Okay, so hearing all these, these are more or less just maybe like countermeasure maneuvers or things that you can maybe add to an aircraft. But... You know, what about the fundamental design of the aircraft in general, right? The principle behind radar is that you have to send a signal and then receive something back. But what happens if you don't receive something back? That is the exact idea that led to the creation of the first really true stealth plane, known as the F-117. Now, the U-2 was considered to be stealth for a little bit because it could fly so high. The SR-71, because of its speed and height, was also considered to be stealth. But the first plane that flew at a normal ceiling that operated normally that was stealth was known as the F-117 Nighthawk. And its birth came from Skunk Works as well. And what actually had happened was this radar technician came into 
uh, Ben Richards' office one day and said, hey, I've got this book published by a Russian scientist named Pyotr Ulfmastev called Method of Edge Waves in the Physical Theory of Diffraction. And it has every equation you would need to calculate the radar cross-section of something. So what if we built an aircraft that we could minimize this as much as possible? Computers at the time were, you know, not the best. And so how they did this was they took a bunch of 2D shapes that could not be rounded because the computer could not compute round edges. And they basically built a plane out of these 2D shapes. And then they did tests on them individually and then compounded the RCS number together. And they came up with this shape that they thought was perfect. And what's interesting is there's some claims that maybe other countries and other people knew about the importance of this paper, but no one could figure out how to make a shape fly because the technology didn't exist. Now, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but essentially the F-117 is the first thing that really utilizes this idea. And it's funny because at some point down the line, uh, this Russian scientist moves to America, and I think he teaches at a Californian school, and Ben Rich visited him and said, hey, I want you to know, like, your paper is what shaped my entire aircraft. He tells him this in the 1990s by the time the aircraft is declassified, but it's kind of a funny thing to, at the time, the Soviet mathematician had no idea he was creating an enemy aircraft. So the thing that really changed everything and showed people how powerful the stealth was, they're going to a stealth test. A few different companies had come up with their designs, and they start pinging the Lockheed Skunk Works design and they're reading the poll. And so they say, okay, we need a poll with a smaller RCS. So they give money to Lockheed and say, hey, can you make one? And Lockheed makes such a drastic reduction in the radar cross section that the other companies go, wow, if they can do that to a poll, what are they doing to the aircraft? It turns out that the aircraft didn't get picked up the first time until a bird landed on it. And bird droppings, like in were such a large effect on it that it doubled the size of the radar cross-section. They had built this shape that was insane. So they get the contract, they build the plane, and this thing, it looks like a pyramid. It has this odd shape. If you look at where UFOs were sighted in the 80s, and then you look at the shape of this aircraft, you may think, hey, some of those UFOs may have been F-117s because they were flying a while before we actually publicly announced them. But... This technology was actually attempted to be moved to something beyond planes, Andrew. Do you know what they moved it to? You want to talk about it? That's right. They thought, well, well, if we can do this in the air, why not at the sea? And so they invented the sea shadow, a stealth boat. Borrowing these same principles, right, very angular design, the idea to deflect radar waves. And what's better than that is it's for sale. Yes. Actually, uh, what had happened was they had really wanted to push this idea of a stealth destroyer and they built it up on a catamaran hole in it. It's just such an odd looking ship. And we were talking about it and we were like going back and forth and I sent him a picture and he goes, oh, that's so weird. And he looked it up and there it was listed an article that said the sea shadow is for sale and the price was pretty modest. Well, it went up for auction and then there seemed to be some price drops Mm -hmm. and then somebody bought it and they dismantled it. Yeah, and that that crushed our hearts because just for a brief fleeting moment, we had envisioned a floating podcast studio. We would come to the guest on the boat and interview them there. You know, we may not have had uh, the money to purchase it, but we would have done something. We would have taken a loan out. But sadly, you can only get so far off mechanical engineering. You know, I love love it. Obviously, I majored in it. But Ben Rich said at the time that the F-117 was 70% shape, 30% materials. So, sadly, now materials have to come into play. Yeah, the inevitable end of all mechanical engineering pursuits is materials, especially when you need to push performance beyond, you know, your average levels. And in this case, they came up with these radar-absorbing paints that could coat the surface of the aircraft and help beyond just the shape of it to attenuate or absorb electromagnetic radiation. And these paints fall into a class of materials known as radar-absorbing materials, or RAMs. Uh, But before we can get to how exactly they work, we should probably establish an understanding of what happens when an electromagnetic wave actually hits a material. And it's gonna there's gonna be basically three things that emerge. You're it's gonna be split into reflected power, transmitted power, and absorbed power. The reflected is what's going to be well reflected, like the name implies. Transmitted is gonna be that what goes through the material, and absorbed is gonna refer to 
um, power energy that's dissipated in the material into some other form of energy. Maybe that's heat. Maybe it's electricity. And when it comes to designing a material to absorb, we want to minimize the amount of signal that's reflected back, right? That's the whole idea of hiding from radar. You don't want any reflection. And that starts with this idea of impedance matching. What is impedance matching, Andrew? When an electromagnetic wave uh, enters a material, it has a certain impedance or resistance to uh, entering into that material. So free space or air has an impedance of about 377 ohms. And so if you have a material, right, if you have an electromagnetic wave moving through free space or air and hits a material with a different impedance, that's going to result in reflection. And so you can think of impedance as defining an, an amount of admittance. And so if the admittance of air and your material are different, that means that something's not getting admitted, right? You're going to have some reflection, and uh, that's not what we want. And so impedance matching refers to the idea of having your material match the impedance of free space so that you maximize the amount of um, absorption or transmission into that material. And so this can happen by just matching the impedance, um, but it can also happen by uh, causing two properties of your material to be equal to one another. Those are the permittivity and the permeability. But that's actually a much harder problem and one that's continuously, you know, at the forefront of research in this area and one that we'll get into in the next couple sections. But one question is, how do we actually measure these materials, right? Mm -hmm. Shoot a radar wave and see what comes back, I guess. Well, there's a couple different ones and they, they give you different amounts of information. The first one is known as a vector network analyzer. And that is this idea. So you put your material in this chamber and you you send signal through it and you can measure, you know, um, the reflection characteristics, the transmission characteristics. You can get the um, the phase and the magnitude of the wave as it uh, un under those different modes. And it's, it's essential for characterizing the performance of these materials, especially in terms of impedance matching, reflection loss, um, and things like bandwidth. But it's not, you know... It, because of the way that the experiment is structured, it's not really a real test, right? Like you, you don't have some distance, you don't have medium through which the, the radar is going to travel. And so the Naval Research Lab came up with this alternative test called the ARCH test. And it's called that because the material is essentially placed on a some sort of platform under an arch. And on one side of the arch, you have your transmitter of radar. And then on the other, at a, I don't know, what, how would you call this angle where it... A different angle. <laughs> at, a, at a different angle, sure, but it's a, a complementary angle. At a ninety degree angle yes. from the at a ninety degree angle from the transmitter, you have a receiver, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna try to strike the material and have it reflect back. And in that case, it's it's much closer to a real test. And um, this is also just a very common of, way of getting practical kind of real world uh, results from this. And when you perform these measurements, what they're really looking for is reflection loss, or um, you know. A, a loss in the amount, you know, input versus output. How do we quantify that? It's measured in decibels. But usually at this point, it, it's so low, it's in negative decibels. Mm. And now for the real reason you're all here. How do you actually design a radar-absorbing material? What what makes it radar-absorbing? See, I'm here for the fun stories. Now you're here for the real explanations in the science. And to do that, we have to talk about those things I mentioned earlier, permittivity and permeability. We can start with permittivity and dielectric loss. Permittivity describes a material's ability to polarize under an electric field. So this means a material with a high permittivity will polarize more. Um, but what does it mean for a material to polarize? Uh, under an electric field, charged particles in a material will try to align themselves to that field. Uh, that is, negatively charged electrons and positively charged atomic nuclei will undergo a charge separation. Um, for a molecule, this can actually result in them reorienting themselves to have their dipoles aligned to the field. A dielectric material is a material that's electric, uh, electrically insulating. So it means it doesn't have any like free or loose electrons. And so in an applied electric field, um, charge carriers in this material can only undergo that charge separation. So that means they shift from their average equilibrium positions. And so electrons basically become displaced opposite the direction of the field and the nuclei are displaced in the direction of the field. And that creates sort of polarization. Um, if a dielectric is composed of weakly bonded molecules, then, like I mentioned earlier, they can actually reorient themselves to align to the field. But that requires a certain uh, viscosity of the material for that to actually happen. Compare this with, like, a conductor where electrons are free to float like copper, right? They're, they're, they're not just going to be displaced from their uh, average positions. They're actually going to flow um, in relation to the electric field. This sounds pretty complex. 
Indeed it is. And it only gets worse because while there's something known as permittivity, there's also complex permittivity. And this describes polarization under an alternating electric field, like an electromagnetic wave or AC current. And in this case, complex permittivity is split into a real and an imaginary component. This is where math lost me. The day they introduced imaginary numbers, I was out. Oh, yeah, I was taking an electrical engineering course. It was required for our major, and as soon as we got into the imaginary components, I was pretty solidified in my choice not to do electrical engineering. I think that's fair. I think that all the math you do should be real, and if there's fake stuff in it, what's the point of doing it? Well, unfortunately, we live in the real world, and that means we have to do imaginary math, and so when we're this split, right? You see, so you have the real and the imaginary component. The real component tells us about like the magnitude of the storage capability. Um, this is basically just what we've heard before. The imaginary component tells us the amount of energy that's lost to other processes. What kind of processes are these? Well, there's three big ones, but there's actually a lot of different ones. And there's a lot of dispute within the literature of uh, the nature and the mechanisms by which some of these occur. But we'll boil it down to the top three. That's all you need to know. Uh, The first of these is conduction. So if you have a conducting material, then current can be induced within that material. And as current is flowing along that material, you're going to have some amount of resistance. And resistance generates heat. And so you'll basically have a a, a certain amount of that energy that's lost as heat. And that's a way of consuming uh, EM wave energy. And so you might think, well, great, we'll just make a super conductive material, but not so fast. Too much conductivity actually creates an impedance match because if a material is superconductive, you'll actually end up increasing the amount of reflection. So it ends up being kind of an interesting problem where you want enough conduction uh, to help you absorb the wave, but you don't want too much. And this relates to this idea of a percolation threshold. Um, And the way you can think about this is imagine like a random array of conducting materials, right? If you have a few of them and they're well spread out, you're not going to be conducting to them. But if you continuously place them, up to a certain point, you might be able to form a bridge between them, and that's kind of what you're looking for, a point when a set of disordered, sort of discrete units starts to exhibit long-range connectivity. So that's conduction. The, the, The one thing we have to know is that the permittivity will actually change with the frequency of our electric field, and what that actually means is that a change in polarization is non-instantaneous. It doesn't happen, uh, it doesn't match the frequency of the, the wave, which means that there's a lag. And this brings up the idea of relaxation. So materials where molecules can realign themselves, the realignment takes some amount of time, right? There's other molecules around them. Um, there's various other forces at play. And so there ends up being a little bit of a time lag, right? It can't keep pace with the frequency of the, the wave. And this lag actually results in energy loss due to friction and various other uh, mechanisms that are happening. And the last one is resonance. So atoms, ions, electrons, they have these characteristic absorption frequencies. And those are essentially the frequencies that they naturally oscillate in the absence of any external force. And so when your electromagnetic wave frequency matches that, it actually causes the material to absorb that and oscillate at a a higher amplitude. And so that's also a big uh, method of absorption. And then the other thing is, aside from these, so these are all, to some extent, intrinsic material properties. But aside from those, things like defects and interfaces in the microstructure can also serve as polarization sites. Defects can often have loose or dangling bonds. Those things will try to reorient. Um, uh, Interfaces will also have two different materials with different properties on either side. Those end up being polarization sites. And so... When designing these materials, things like defects or, or, or interfaces, things that maybe would be seen as bad in other materials design applications, end up being a positive. Cool story, Andrew. I literally could not care less about the science. Give me some materials and some examples. Go. Well, early on, carbon materials were recognized as having high EM absorption capability. Um, in fact, late war German U boats had their snorkels and periscopes treated with rubber graphite mixtures. Uh, called Sumpf and Schwarzenfeger. Oh, I know this one. Because the Germans did the exact same thing to some of their bombers. They would put carbon and impregnate it into the plywood that they used. No, this is fake. Really? Yeah, I I went and I I did a deep dive because I found this too. And then I, I found this interesting thread on Reddit where a historian who, this was like his PhD dissertation, basically went through and said like, the guy who made it claimed it, yeah. but there is literally no evidence of this. Wild. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is future Jared here. 
Andrew and I, right after this, have a discussion in which we talk about whether or not this was actually a real story. I cut that out, and I'm going to give you the answer. Interestingly enough, the guy who designed the plane that we were talking about, who is uh, Walter Horton, not a very German name, surprisingly, he claimed that the plane, which is known as the Horton HO-229 V3, which is one of the German Wunderwaffes or Wonder Weapons that they were designing, which is this crazy-looking jet, he actually claimed that it was one of the first stealth planes. The Smithsonian Institute got the plane, and they took a bunch of special devices, such as electron microscopes and other things, and looked over it, and all they could find was plywood, no special coatings. Yeah. So it turns out he's a liar. Anyways, back to the episode. These materials that the Germans were using, uh, the ones that I'm not going to pronounce again, um, they had a layered structure, and so... Uh, and, and but apparently the the big problem with them uh, was they they were actually really hard to apply, like the manufacturing technology there was just not up to snuff, and they also degraded in seawater. It's worth noting we're not going to get into this at all. I don't want to explain this stuff, but it's interesting because German U boats were also the first people to use anechoic tiles, which are great at reducing sonar reflections. Why? How? All that? Don't worry about it. Another episode maybe. Boats. The boat episode. One day. You're you're on you're on probation from episode recommendations. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but these, these materials were difficult to apply, but the Germans were on the right track. Um, carbon is a good material for radar absorption, owing to its low density, high uh, and tunable conductivities, uh, anti-corrosion properties. Um, across many different types of allotropes of carbons, and these allotropes will include things like carbon black, carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes, graphite, reduced graphene. Um, and we'll get into these, but there were some other materials explored kind of in this similar dielectric space, such as ceramics, things like barium titanate, magnesium oxide, um, titanium oxide, silica, zinc oxide, or even some like crazy stuff like, or even silicon nitride or silicon carbide. But in addition to ceramics, uh, you also have things like polymers. Besides just the epoxies and the rubbers that they would use as a matrix material, um, there are a number of conducting polymers uh, that have been studied, including things like polyaniline and polypyrrole. Um, polypyrrole specifically tends to be unstable, so it's often mixed with things. But within these, they have um, these these polymers have partial oxidation or, or doping, and that causes the polymer to become conducting through the formation of things called polarons and bipolarons. Basically, these are the charge carriers along the chains. And conductivity occurs through a phonon assist, through a phonon assisted hopping between these randomly distributed states. Carbon materials and polymer composites are they're promising for absorption applications, mainly because of their relatively easy processing, design flexibility, low density, the things I've already mentioned. However, these materials actually tend to have poor performance at lower thicknesses, uh, like less than two millimeters which is not great for maybe aircraft where you're trying to make a paint. Uh, and they tend to also be confined to a narrow band range. Remember, we talked about all these different bands earlier in the episode. You want to be able to absorb across a lot of those. And if you're, you're only targeting a few for a military application, that's not great. Um, so in the interest of pushing absorption capabilities further, we then see the development of magnetic rams. And this brings us to the property known as permeability and, from that, magnetic loss. Permeability is a word I do recognize, Andrew. I know that that is the ability to magnetize in response to magnetic field. But that is about the extent of my knowledge in any of this. Do you know how magnetization works? Uh, yeah, positive attracts negative, and negative repels negative. Well, that'll help you stick things on the refrigerator, but in order to understand magnetic rams, we're going to need to go a little bit deeper. Magnetization in a material tends to be derived from things like magnetic moments um, of a material's electron. Ordinarily, you have basically a bunch of electrons in a material that are arranged such that their magnetic moments uh, cancel out, right? Like imagine like a bunch of randomly arranged signals. It ends up just being kind of a null. Um, this is actually due to the Pauli exclusion principle. But even when you have unpaired electrons that aren't going to be confined uh, in this way, um, these will actually also tend to be oriented in random directions. But sometimes these can be aligned to allow the material to produce a strong magnetic field on its own. This propensity and ability actually are what define different types of magnetic materials. The ones that you're familiar with, the positive attract negative, are known as ferromagnets. So these are materials with unpaired electrons that have achieved a lower energy state by orienting, orienting themselves parallel to one another. So there's just a thermodynamic 
energetic driving force to actually make them align themselves. Um, typically, you'll actually see like large regions of alignment where all these magnetic moments have lined up, and these form what they call magnetic domains. The biggest lie about ferromagnets is that I always thought that it meant that it had to have some amount of iron in it because ferroferritic. I didn't realize till later that it meant more than one material sometimes. It's probably because the first magnet they found was iron yeah based but what are these now what kind of materials we got the common materials tend to be iron cobalt nickel and their uh, alloys so i don't feel as stupid then as a kid at least i was somewhat close one out of three is okay but there's more beyond this if we include things like rare earth magnets what are the so what are the other kinds of magnets we're worried about then i don't know about worried about but you also have things like paramagnets Okay, so these materials, they have those unpaired electrons, but they're still randomly oriented, right? The difference is that they can still align themselves when they're subject to a magnetic field up to what we call a saturation point. This is like the maximum amount of alignment that these can endure. So this is something like aluminum, where even though it's not magnetic on its own, you can still induce a magnetic response in it under a magnetic field. Pretty cool. The next kind are diamagnets. These tend to resist a magnetic field, so under them they're repelled. A lot of materials have this property, um, but it actually takes a strong enough magnetic field to really observe it. Common materials that you'll see with this are actually carbon and copper. Okay, so getting back to permeability, just like permittivity, it also has real and complex components when subject to an alternating magnetic field, uh, where this complex component uh, is going to represent losses. Andrew, I just went on a whole entire rant about how I did not like complex numbers. Why are you bringing them back again? Because we have to. So, what do the losses in magnetism look like then? Okay, so in this case, there are maybe four primary loss mechanisms. This is where it started to get a little bit complicated in the literature, but we'll start out with the main ones. The first is eddy current loss. So, current can be induced within a conducting material in the presence of an alternating magnetic field, and just like conductive losses in um, maybe a, a dielectric material or conducting material, um, you're also going to have a resistive heating um, resulting in some losses. But then you'll also get something known as ferromagnetic resonance. This is also somewhat similar to the permittivity case. Uh, ferromagnetic materials have a precession frequency, and this, this kind of refers to the rotation of those magnetic moments. Uh, and when the frequency matches that precession frequency, um, you're going to you know, similarly get a sense of absorption and an amplitude increase and Similarly, you're going to get energy that's absorbed, lost as heat, and this uh, ferromagnetic resonance frequency can actually be tuned based on the particle size of the magnetic materials, which is kind of cool. Next, you'll have another form of resonance known as domain wall resonance. Um, we mentioned the different domains, and between them there are walls, or kind of like odd energy barriers. You can think of these as grain boundaries, actually. Um, well, you can think of these as being like grain boundaries. Um, and these domain walls actually have their own resonance frequency that can lead and be a mechanism for absorption, and this can similarly be tuned. And lastly, we have hysteresis loss, which is a very common, well-known, well-understood. Lastly, we have hysteresis loss, and this is basically the lagging of magnetization behind a magnetizing force. Think of it like the energy spent attempting to realign the magnetic moments of electrons and domains. You can maybe compare this to, to friction, right? Like you align the moment, the magnetic moments of a, a material, and then all of a sudden your magnetic field changes. You now have to break those out of their alignment to try to realign them. And in, in doing that, it's going to cost some energy to break it out. There's an energy barrier there. So once again, science done. Let's talk about it actually being used. So here's something going all the way back to the F-117. The F-117 uses a very special kind of paint, but it is referred to as iron ball paint, a little bit of a silly name. Does not actually get through how difficult it was to make. First of all, in case you're wondering, it is not literally just balls of iron. Yeah, it is. No, it was actually a product of a decomposition of iron pentacarbonyl. And so while they are flakes of iron, they're actually obtained in a very special way. And so what you do is you then take... So they are iron balls. But they're special iron balls. They're not just like... You can't just like go and like machine a ball of iron. It's special iron balls. Yeah. Yeah. It's a carbonyl iron. Yeah, special iron. So okay. they take the special iron and they disperse it in an epoxy and then it 
is a cool little special pain and it does magnetic resonance stuff, all the cool science stuff he explained. But here's a fun story about it. So they're building the test aircraft for the F-117. And actually just after they announce the official one, they decide to retire one of the test aircraft. And so they're going to send it for the big home in the sky. I don't know what museum it was going to. But the paint's classified at the moment. You know, we're talking this is the 1980s, 1990s. So they can't actually let the paint get out there. And so they sandblast, they media blast, they get all of the paint off it. And there's a process that is very not great to be the guy doing it. It's very dangerous. They're covered in this protective gear. And when it's all said and done, they've got this now bare metal plane. They thought it would be really funny to go on the side of it and write toxic death on the side in spray paint. Because the plane was already going to get repainted just a normal black. So when they put it on display... And so they took this blank canvas and they put skull and crossbones. They were toxic death. They were a few other things because I guess they were annoyed with the job they had to do. And they thought it was funny. And so you can see clips of this, this plane actually flying in the sky with just toxic death written on the side of it. And it looks a little silly, obviously. You know, I'm sure it went black again. Uh, for those who can't see, Jared has rotated his laptop um, to show me the screen with an image of an F-117 Nighthawk without paint on it with the words toxic death, presumably flying. And something else. I don't know what that says. I can't read. It's very low, low, low quality image for back in the day. But iron ball paint is somewhat of a class of materials too. Like it, it's not, it, it had some variations to it and it probably still does um, that are probably still classified. But you'll get things like core shell structures with those iron balls. Um, you also get a density gradient in the size of the ball. Remember we told you that some of these loss mechanisms actually depend on the particle size. And so if you want to have broadband absorption, you're going to have a, a gradient maybe or, or changes in the, the, the particle size as a, as a function of depth. So the F-117 uses carbonyl iron like we talked about, but what else can you use? Well, like I mentioned earlier, right, there are those three kind of main ferromagnetic materials like iron, nickel, cobalt. And then I mentioned their oxides. So you'll commonly see um, iron oxides, uh, nickel ferrite, or even nickel oxides as well. But the thing is, uh, especially if you look at trends in the research, it turns out that size matters. Electromagnetic interactions tend to increase with decreasing particle size. And so due to the unique size, surface, and quantum tunneling effect, nanoscale materials uh, actually have excellent electronic and magnetic properties. And past a critical size, ferromagnetic materials actually exhibit something known as super paramagnetism. Um, that is, they display um, super high magnetic saturation and low coercivity. That essentially just means they have a high saturation point, meaning under an electric magnetic field, they'll get a lot of alignment. They can align to a very high degree, but the low coercivity means that once that magnetic field is removed, these ma magnetic moments are going to just randomize again. And so what this means is that there's less sort of sticking in place of alignment of these dipoles. So if you have a high frequency um, electromagnetic field, it can adapt to have that real component of absorption um, quite a bit better. So as we've learned in numerous episodes at this point, Andrew, there's no such thing as a perfect solution. So is a way to combine these approaches and get the best of each? Yeah, and, and you can. It, there's a number of composite approaches in the literature, and that's from the literature's perspective, that seems to be where a lot of research in RAMS is going. Surveying the literature, there's way too many different variations of this to really cover um, extensively or in detail. So I've grouped things, and I've, I've picked a few case studies and examples that I think are particularly interesting. Um, and, and novel, and in some cases just kind of wacky. The first one I want to highlight is, and one that you see quite a bit, is the idea of creating a composite with carbon nanotubes and then a, you know sprinkled in magnetic nanoparticles. Um, and the carbon nanotubes are used for their electrical conductivity, they have great mechanical properties, low density, and a large surface area. And then you combine that with the properties of magnetic materials and you start to get the best of both worlds, but what's really cool is that you actually get um, interaction effects that no one solution would have achieved alone. The inclusion of the nanoparticles actually contributes to additional interfaces and defects within the carbon nanotubes and the material at large, and these serve for further sites for polarization losses. Additionally, the conductive networks that form can promote lots of internal reflections within the material or scattering, and this is just another way of 
maybe prolonging the time that the electromagnetic wave is in the material or at least reorienting it from the source. Furthermore, a lot of the eddy currents that are induced within the magnetic particles have a means of transfer and resistive loss through the carbon nanotubes. And um, if you continue to survey the literature we saw, we see several variations and improvements on this approach, such as using multi-walled carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes with metallic nanowires inside them. Um, one person used a coating of polyaniline on top of carbon nanotubes to try to make sure that, to limit the conductivity a little bit. There's also the use of coarse shell nanoparticles, anisotropic particles with weird shapes like flowers is one of them I saw, um, and other things. Basically, a lot of attempts based on trends in nanotechnology and nanoscience to try to affect the attenuation. That's one class. You see a lot of kind of variations on a theme there. The next are these, these like 3D, what they call graphene-like networks. Um, so a, a graphene network refers to a structure where you basically have two-dimensional graphene sheets, um, and these are interconnected to form a three-dimensional, highly conductive network. Um, and these structures tend to be characterized by not only having uh, you know, conductivity, but also having ultra-high porosity, a low density, and high surface area. These are then loaded with magnetic nanoparticles that not only have their own loss mechanisms, but form interfaces with the walls of these um, that can serve as additional polarization sites. Um, and with the high porosity, both on a micro, meso, and macro scale, it basically ton allows for a ton of um, scattering and uh, multiple reflections inside of the material. And I, I thought this was kind of an interesting approach of just kind of filling basically like a sponge almost with um, the magnetic nanoparticles. And the last one I saw that I thought was just kind of novel or interesting uh, were the use of fish skins as precursors for the materials. In this case, they took nickel cobalt and nickel cobalt oxide um, nanoparticles and they mixed these with a sort of, and they created a hybrid nanocomposite is what they're calling it. Um, and they synthesized this actually using fish skin derived porous carbon, um, basically through a hydrothermal treatment. Um, the process basically involved cleaning and drying the fish skin, cutting it into pieces, and then mixing it with a potassium hydroxide solution. Uh, the mixture was then, you know, subject to these hydrothermal treatments, and finally a carbonizing process. Um, basically, it just created a super porous carbon uh, that could then be impregnated with all these different um, magnetic nanoparticles. Almost you can think of this as like forming a foam. And their whole idea was that it creates something that's maybe more environmentally sustainable, but <laughs> I don't know that the military industrial complex has ever really cared. Sustainable warfare, that's a new one. And I, I just thought these were cool. You, you know, you'll see a lot of different kind of variations of this where it's some dielectric material mixed with some magnetic material and lots of attempts to, to tweak these and their interactions and the interfaces and the shapes and then measuring the response. A lot of what you see is cook and look, um, but there is quite a bit of work now with simulating radar response um, in various um, simulation tools and, and, and FEA programs. And I think these hold a lot of promise in the future, but if you go back to our modeling episode, they're still running into the same problem where you have macro scale interactions, but you know, based on these examples, you also have mesoscale and micro scale interactions as well. So it becomes actually a difficult problem to simulate as well. And it may be that one composite approach uh, isn't your only solution. You're probably going to have um, gradients where you have different layers that are designed to absorb different materials. And this is a very timely episode because the B-21, which is our new stealth bomber, well, ours being the U.S. in this case, new stealth bomber just took its first flight. And already... That I we see, know of. That we know of. And already I see so many people speculating, oh, what's this? What does this do for stealth? What's this do? So... It's very interesting to see where stealth technology is at from what we know, where it's at academically, and perhaps where it goes in the future. And as we begin to learn stuff, as things get declassified, it'll be very interesting to see if some of these things we've talked about as possibilities are actually being used and we just don't know it. Yeah, and as usual, we really only scratch the surface on radar absorption. Microwave absorption, which is kind of contained in here and also somewhat different, is very broad and there's a lot of uh, geometries and techniques, things like adaptive radar absorption that we just really couldn't cover in one episode. Um, but hopefully this can serve as a strong primer to let you dive into the literature because there's a lot of interesting stuff out there and maybe you're inspired to hop in there. I think there's a lot of room for development still because, I mean, you know, that's classified. Yeah. Well, 
Anyways, thank you so much for joining us. This podcast is sponsored by Elsevier or Materials Today. They're a great publishing company. They got a lot of really good articles, and they also have some great conferences, and they're just someone that we're a huge fan of. And so you can check them out at elsevier.com or materialstoday.com. Yeah, we actually referenced a few of their articles for this episode. You can find them in the show notes. In addition to the many other articles that we have referenced, we can't guarantee that all of them are consistent with one another, but that just adds to the mystery. And you can really see the difference between Andrew being very science heavy and mine being like military, militaryguys.com. We'd also like to give a big thanks to you for listening. You can go to your favorite podcasting platform, and if you really like the show, or if you think there's ways that we can improve, you should leave us a review. We've been doing this for about five years at this point, and we're always looking to improve and make the next five years even better. So if you have any ideas, maybe for a topic, or for maybe maybe there's a quality aspect, maybe our audio is a little bit off, let us know in a review, or reach out to us. You can find us on Instagram, at materialism.podcast, or through our email, at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Also, we want to give a huge shout out to people who make the music. Thank you, Colabyte. Thank you, Alphabot. You can find them on Spotify and YouTube, and we will have the links to that in the show notes. Catch you next time. Thank you, guys. Bye. The adventures of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.